peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I ever get back to its root. Root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes you're out at the old home. Thanks, Marcia, and thanks uh, to all of you for yet again packing this room and helping us figure out our maximum capacity. <laughs> I certainly hope there's nobody from the <coughs> fire department here. I was trying to figure out how to introduce uh, Bill Shipley to kick us off today, and I thought about the rotary four-way test. And I thought, that's actually the perfect reference point, because I am lucky enough to work with and for somebody who embody embodies the rotary four-way test in how he guides our organization. Please join me uh, in welcoming to get us started the managing partner of the York Revolution, Bill Shipley. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so what's the four-way test? <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to People's Bank Park. And that is just such a pleasure to be able to say it's so much easier than <laughs> uh, and, and to have a, a local business that's our, our centerpiece for this park is really just a, a terrific step forward. And we're looking forward to many years of, of a great partnership with People's Bank. At our, as we enter our 10th year, it's a time to reflect for the York Revolution and a time to renew. Eric, in his comments, is going to talk about some of the specifics of how we're doing that. I mean, I'd like to just reflect a little bit generally that uh, in nine years, uh, we've come a long way as the York Revolution. We're not uh, new. It's, it really, it's not a shiny new thing in town anymore. We're, we're part of York, and I think a very positive and uh, enriching part of York. Uh, about 20 years ago, when, when the idea of a professional baseball team in York began, which is um, about one-fifth of the life of the York Rotary Club, <laughs> is, is when, uh, you know, this idea, is, it's, it's been around, I mean, what we've seen is we've seen it come to fruition in a positive way. We're bringing smiles, we're bringing families, and friendly entertainment, and uh, championships, and uh, you know, just great all-round experiences. And I think what we have ahead of us is opportunities for even more of that. And it's just going to get better and better. Uh, I'd encourage each one of you to help us continue to renew and continue to you know experience the excitement that we did in 2007. And if you don't have a season ticket, go get one. Why not? You know, I mean, if you if you can't get the 70 games, share it. And, you know, find somebody who can. Um, so thank you very much for your uh, support through these years on behalf of the whole team. And I know uh, that, that you know, we're looking forward to many, many good years ahead. And with that, I want to introduce our president of the Atlantic League of Professional Baseball. Rick White is in his second year in this role and has uh, brought a level of professionalism to the Atlantic League of Professional Baseball that he can explain better than me. So, Rick Good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I want to start by saying two things about the Rotary Club. Number one, congratulations to the chapter. 100 years is truly remarkable. 24th in size throughout the world is equally remarkable. So, congratulations. <laughs> In my misspent youth, I had the good fortune to do a couple of things right, and I shall be forever grateful to the Rotary Club. I was a recipient of a Rotary Fellowship when I was in college, and I'm always going to be indebted to the organization for that. And so it gives me a good deal of pleasure to be here and to be amongst you. Thank you for the opportunity, Bill and Eric. Um, Marcia mentioned cell phones earlier. 
I don't want anybody to turn them on, so I don't want to violate that. <coughs> but how many people in here have a cell phone? <laughs> Everybody, right? Let me ask a different question. How many people here remember rotary phones? <laughs> and how many of you still use them? <laughs> so we have one whole bunch. The Luddite is among us. <laughs> you know, I think that's an interesting segue if you think about what I'd like to talk about today on behalf of the club and then on behalf of the league, and that's innovation. Last year when I was with you, I previewed a baseball we were going to introduce midway through the season. And it was a baseball that had red and blue stitches. It hadn't been done in over 60 years. And we reintroduced an official baseball with red and blue stitches that nobody thought was possible and that nobody really could understand why. But we wanted to bring a certain type of distinction, a certain type of relevance, and we wanted to underscore the fact that our league is the most innovative league in professional baseball, without question, but we believe in professional sports. <coughs> Against a very modest platform compared to big league sports, we do things differently and we do things we think with a great sense of progression. We don't do that simply for the effort. We do that because we believe it reinforces our brand, it reinforces our relevance, and much like you and your individual businesses, it appeals to a different level of audience than baseball traditionally has. We believe we must remain relevant in order to remain viable. And just like those folks who were innovative around <coughs> cellular technology compared to dial-up technology. We think we always have to maintain the principles and the tradition of baseball, but move forward wherever we can. And we've been very fortunate when you think about contextually how we've been able to do that, and generally and on the ground how we've been able to affect that. So I'm delighted to tell you last year's baseball, which was a grand experiment, and our objective is on three criteria. Believe it or not, we found a way to make money from that baseball. And so we reduce the expenses that our clubs endure when they have to do that. And for what I have to do on behalf of the clubs, that's incredibly relevant. Number two, we received a great deal of attention. So much so that the ball we first used at our All-Star game last year is now residing in the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's the first artifact from the Atlantic League. And I'm delighted to tell you it will be on display through the conclusion of this year. We're really proud of that. And third and foremost, it brought additional influence to our league. Because the moment we announced we were adopting that baseball, Three other independent baseball leagues picked it up as their official baseball as well. We're really proud of that. We do this in the context of a league that has eight member clubs. They live day to day on the ups and downs of not only performance, but the ups and downs of their ability to relate to their community and to relate to their environment. And the league has always been known as one that is progressive and looks into the future. If you all look behind you to People's Bank Park, think about what you see that are due, the items you see that are entirely due to the Atlantic League and its clubs. Seven out of our eight clubs were built to Atlantic League specifications. That has to do a lot with folks like Peter Kirk to my left, one of the founders of the league and one of the great baseball minds in the world. It has to do with an item ownership like Bill Shipley. We were the first league to have walk-around ballparks. And for those of you with children, think about how much fun it is to take your kids and to walk around the ballpark. It adds another dimension to the game. We were the first ones to install children's fun zones in each one of our parks. We were among the first to have outdoor picnic areas and open seat seating in our ballparks. We are amongst still the only leagues to want intimacy in terms of seating. But against that, we're still able to include things like patios behind home plate 
and great sight lines along the, the fields. This ballpark in particular not only has those features, but it has a remarkable characteristics that is almost unique to all of professional baseball, and that is a clubhouse that resides down the right field line. That allows fans the opportunity to engage with players as they come into the ballpark, as opposed to players coming in and out of tunnels. It forces interaction, which is something in a fan-friendly context we believe to be innovative, progressive, and it works. So as evidence of what we're doing now, we, we want to relate to that context. Last year, we introduced a red and blue baseball. The year before that, we introduced pace of play initiatives that have been phenomenally successful in our league. We've reduced the average nine inning game time in the Atlantic League from two or from three hours and one minute to two hours and 41 minutes within a year and a half. We believe that we will be closer to 230 than 240 by the end of this year. But the better part of that is. In the winter time, after we introduced that a year and a half ago, Major League Baseball, their affiliated clubs in AAA and in AA, adopted virtually every single initiative that we had pioneered in our modest Atlantic League. The idea is we can do things that help generate interest, fan involvement, a fan-friendly enterprise, remain viable with our existing clientele and new guests who come to our ballparks and all the while do something that influences the direction of the professional game. So with that in mind, we've done something this year that's truly extraordinary. Uh, all of you have an anniversary shirt at your desk or at your, your table. It was designed in conjunction with the club and a graphic designer who is a tremendously skilled young man by the name of Sky Dillon. Now I understand Sky is here, I just don't know where Sky's at. Sky, are you around? There he is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Sky Dillon to you. Now, a, a t-shirt is one thing. I think we all probably say, well, that's nice, it's attractive, uh, thank you very much. But Sky, in conjunction with the league, has done something truly extraordinary. And I want you to note today's get-together, because within a year, you're going to see something at the major league level that has never been done before tomorrow. And you are getting a sneak preview of something that's going to occur on the field that is truly extraordinary. Now, you wouldn't know it from my gray hair and my kind of crummy looking frame these days, but in the old days I was a catcher, and so I've always taken a particular interest in those skilled ball players who manage a game and really are the field generals on the baseball field. They generally go unrecognized. They're certainly hidden by all of their equipment, their masks, and so forth that they truly are the guys who run the game for the defensive side of the squad. We took inspiration from some things that have happened in the game of professional hockey. We also took inspiration from our partners at the Rawlings Sporting Goods Company. But most of all, we took inspiration from our clubs and their communities. And in conjunction with clubs, and with Sky and his, his enterprising practice, we have reinvented catcher's equipment. So for those of you familiar with hockey, you know hockey, hockey goalies wear masks that are highly decorated. I'd like you to take a look at a head-to-toe approach that we're going to introduce tomorrow night. And when we're doing that, I will tell you that the most popular television shot in baseball is the center field camera. So think about watching what you're about to see 65% of the time you're watching a baseball broadcast. Eric, could you introduce her? Yes. 
I dare say this is the first time these guys have been models in their life. <laughs> <laughs> really good. <coughs> what we've done is, is really terrific. Uh, working with the Rawlings Sporting Goods Company, we have reinvented a catcher's helmet mask. We've reinvented chest protectors, and for those of you who are close, you can see that we've reinvented shin guards. So truly from head to toe, we're going to have catchers fitted out in indicia and equipment that embodies not only the York Revolution, but also the community of York. Now, perhaps later on we can pass along the, the helmet as long as you all promise to give it back. This, is, <laughs> this helmet cost us probably $2,500 to decorate. Um, it is not inexpensive. But as you look at it, you're going to see reference to the 10th anniversary of the club. You're going to see reference to Brooks Robinson, Hall of Famer, whose statue is outside of the Esplanade. You're going to see graphic reference to the club's primary and secondary logos. And you're going to see reference to Market Square. You'll note nowhere in that dialogue are we talking about a league or a commercial sponsor or some individual who escalates himself against a higher point than uh, the team? It's about the club and its community. And I guarantee you that within a year, Major League Baseball and its catchers will be wearing product similar to this. Now, that's a bit of a false guarantee, and let me tell you why. And this has to do with our league that is unlike any other minor league. We have been in conversations with Major League Baseball and the Major League Baseball's Players Association. Think about that. Your two solvents that are like oil and water. The twain shall never mix, right? They are working with us, giving credit to our league and our clubs and our players to accomplish this on the field moving forward. And that, for our modest little league, is a tremendous accomplishment. So we're really excited about this. This is our breakthrough this year. I will tell you next year, giving the product that this young lady has in her hand, if you extrapolate, you can probably figure out where we're going for phase three. Baseball, catchers, you can figure out the next one. We have four in mind, we'll roll out one a year, but again, it helps to take us to a place where although one might look at our league as humble and modest and small and independent, it gives us the great opportunity to be a beta test laboratory that can move professional baseball to a greater place. And I'm very happy to say you're the first ones in the public to see this. Uh, the players just saw it about an hour ago, so there we go. For us, it's about innovation. It's about being community and family. And it's about always moving forward with those tenants. So I want to say thank you very much. Bill, Eric, thank you for having me. Back to you. Thanks again. Thanks, Rick. And um, the league, I know Bill agrees with me that the league is really lucky to have somebody with the vision and the energy and the experience of Rick at our, at our helm as a league. So turning from the league to the, uh, to back to York and to the York Revolution, who here knows the significance of September 29th, 2006? What happened on September 29th, 2006? At least a few of you were there. <laughs> I have a, who said it, broke ground. I have a Jim Palmer autographed baseball for Scott Rogers. That's right. September 29th, 2006 was the official groundbreaking for what is now, I'm going to pick this up, for what is now People's Bank Park. So a lot of us were in there, a lot of us were there on June 15th, 2007 which was opening day here at what is now People's Bank Park, but September 29th, 2006, was the official groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, the ensuing nine years has really gone by in the blink of an eye. Uh, back in 1994, I was in the room the first time then Mayor Charlie Robertson introduced the idea 
of returning minor league baseball to York. Uh, I very likely thought he was crazy, uh, although I'm smart enough uh, that I probably didn't say so out loud. Uh, early possibilities for returning professional baseball to York included a Frontier League team playing in a modest renovation of Hoffman Stadium at Veterans Memorial Park. A more ambitious version, some of you may remember, called for an Orioles minor league franchise playing at a ballpark on what is now the city's Northwest Triangle site, just a block this way. Of those efforts, the community was, to say the least, skeptical. It took 10 years of frustration, obstacles, failure, and determination to bring the revolution to life. But that uh, series of false starts and doubts really only amplifies the success of the Revolution franchise, which is now a centerpiece of the York community, both on and off the field. What followed that original opening day in 2007 was nine seasons of skydiving mascots, inspiring rallies, spectacular fireworks shows, heart-stopping saves, downtown's antics, Arch Street moonshots over the wall, cannonball salutes from right field, two championships, and over two million fans through our gates. So the frustration is gone, the failure is a distant memory. The skeptics have most certainly been silenced. If you build it in downtown York, at the heart of York County, will they come? Well, the answer here in York is a resounding play ball. And of course, we're gearing up to play ball yet again for the 2016 season, starting tomorrow night up in New Britain, Connecticut, and then here at home next Thursday, April 28th. And I will tell you that it's going to be a humdinger of a season. We have a record 21 giveaways and counting. We added one yesterday. We're going to start on opening night, though, focused on baseball. When we bring back and honor many of the, mem many of the members <coughs> of our fan-selected 10th anniversary team. That team will also be honored with banners on the concourse all season. And the seven revs who have made it all the way to the majors will get their own banners out front on the concourse. And finally, you see our players today wearing our 10th anniversary jersey, which features that 10th anniversary logo. And on the back of those jerseys, what you see is the names of every player who has played for us in those first nine seasons. And the numerals on those jerseys are made up of a collage of fan-submitted ballpark photos of fans here at the ballpark. So we'll wear these jerseys every Friday night of the season, and we'll auction them for charity at the end of the year. And then the next night, next Friday night, April 29th, we launch into the signature promotion of our 10th anniversary season, our Celebrate York series, presented by Memorial Hospital. We took this direction because we realized that we're much more, uh, much, much more than a baseball team. As you heard Bill mention, we're a community-centered enterprise. Uh, we decided, therefore, uh, to use our 10th anniversary to honor 11 Yorkers, or people with York connections, or in one case, a community effort, the York Plan. They're all people or events who represent the breadth of accomplishment and the history of York. And rather than honor them with a, a fancy banquet or with all uh, due apologies to the York County Heritage Trust and Museum exhibit, we decided, we decided to honor them in the most dignified manner we know, with bobbleheads. Uh, and in a couple of cases, a, a coin, a gnome, yes, a gnome, the gnome was all over ESPN yesterday, the gnome is of Bruce Arians, and then a travel mug. Uh, among the honorees are uh, Governor Wolf, Bruce Arians, Jeff Coons, who agreed to let us make a bobblehead of him, General Jacob Devers, the Marquis de Lafayette, and Vonnie Grimes, whose bobblehead includes a music box, complete with a recording of Vonnie playing Take Me Out to the Ball Game on the harmonica. Oh, wow. You doubt me. <laughs> so Rick has fancy catcher's gear. I've got Vonnie. <laughs> There you go. Oh, that's great. So uh, put May 27th on your calendar and, uh, and come out and collect funny. Um, it's still going down there. And then make sure to be here every Friday night, plus July 3rd, when we'll give away the Jake Devers coin at our annual military appreciation game to collect that whole series. We're bringing back plenty of other favorite entertainers, including the Cowboy Monkeys, the Superstars, Mad Chad, the Chainsaw Juggler, and Ex Pogo, which has some roots in York. And we'll also have a, a first-time appearance from the Philly Fanatic. Uh, NASCAR legend Ernie Irvin will be here, and Bucket Ruckus. Bucket Ruckus has a connection to our own Rotarian, Ike Heilman, who I didn't see come in. Is Ike here today? I don't think so. 
Well, Ike has a connection to bucket ruckus. He actually turned us on to it. It remains to be seen whether Ike is involved in the bucket or the ruckus or both. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, we'll continue with fireworks every Saturday night. This year, every single show will be our spectacular Inside the Park fireworks show. And lest you think we've forgotten about the 10th anniversary of this ballpark itself, we've continued to invest to make everyone who comes here say to themselves, man, this place looks like the day it opened. And actually, I don't think it looks like the day it opened. I think it looks a lot better. Uh, to begin with, I love the beautiful new People's Bank Park name and the new ballpark logo design. I'm sure you noticed the new front entrance, and I'm hoping when you turned to sing the anthem, the new, video, the new sign over the video board uh, caught your eye. We are uh, completely thrilled to have a business partner like People's Bank to work with, and I'll ask you all once again to thank Larry Miller and the entire People's Bank board and team for their investment in this community. We have, uh, we have painted almost everything in the ballpark, everything that uh, doesn't move and some things that do. In fact, we're still painting, as you can see out the window. We installed new heritage box seats right down below us here to replace the original ones that failed prematurely. Those bright yellow picnic tents are new and they are reported not to leak. Uh, we'll hope we can't find out on Rotary Picnic Night. And we've also overhauled the area at the top of the third base seats and renamed it Arch Street Eats with some improved and additional local food vendors, new beer options, and additional seating for eating and drinking in that area. I'll close by coming back to two baseball-related items. First, you're going to want to be here on May 14th, when we retire Corey Thurman's number 35 and do a giveaway of a beautiful poster of Corey in action. Corey's contributions to the birth of the Revolution franchise, as you all know, are beyond here, and furthermore, way beyond just the on-field piece, by coming to York and staying here to inspire and coach now hundreds of youth baseball players, Corey showed us all one of the intangibles of having a professional baseball team in our town. So May 14th, make sure to join us for Corey's jersey number retirement. And I'll finish by calling your attention to our closing Friday night, which is September 16th, when we present an honor to the fan-voted top four players in franchise history a promotion patterned off Major League ba Baseball's Franchise 4 that they did at their All-Star game last year. However, as Rick has uh, alluded to, we're going to go MLB one better. We're going to enshrine those four players in what we're calling Mount Revsmore, a replica of Mount Rushmore with our four players replacing the presidents. <laughs> so we're going to announce those four winners on opening night, and then we're going to build our own monument, which will be a giveaway on September 16th to close the season. So you'll want to be here. It's going to be an awesome year. I can't wait to get it started. So without any further hype or distraction on my part, it's my pleasure to introduce the manager of the York Revolution, Mark Mason. Mark. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I would like to start by saying to my players that are here, the players that are on that side of the room that nobody will be able to see when I introduce, could you please come stand up over here? The guys that are sitting over here, you're fine. The guys way in the corner, please come up and stand by the table. If I have any players on that side, could we do the same thing? The guys that are in front, we're fine. Okay, with that said, I would like to say uh, it's an honor once again to be here. Um, it's always an honor and a privilege to be a manager of a professional baseball team. So I'd like to thank Bill and Eric and Peter for giving me the opportunity over the years to do that. This will be year seven for me in York. So uh, I've made York my home. I've been here since 2010. And uh, I've been real excited about that. I've done a lot of speaking appearances over the years, a lot of Rotary Clubs, a lot of Lions Clubs, uh, some high schools, uh, the quarterback club most recently. So uh, I'm getting around a little bit. And I'm getting to recognize a lot of the people and know people here. So it's been, uh, been a great great experience for me. A little bit about our team this year. We're wrapping up spring training today. This is the last day of 10 days and uh, we'll do a nice little workout today because we have a 7.30 bus tomorrow morning to uh, New Britain, Connecticut. So uh, we'll be excited about getting up there and opening their season and opening their ballpark. So I haven't looked at the schedule in detail. I know we're going to have two opening days this year. Sometimes we have three, so I'm not sure where Somerset is, but we'll be there after we leave New Britain. 
and then obviously we'll be here uh, next week on the 28th. So very excited about 10 year anniversary. I think we have a really good ball club. We've had a good camp. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my, my coaching staff because I missed the first half of the camp. Unfortunately, I've been home taking care of my dad for, uh, for about the past four months. So uh, we have everything worked out there and everything's fine. So I want to thank Polo and Fletch for, for everything they did and Nate Sterner um, for helping me with that. So anyways, we have about 14 players here from last year. We have 29 players in camp right now. I have two players that are stuck in the Dominican with visa issues. Hopefully we'll get them here next week. And um, that's just part of the, the way it goes. So uh, obviously we're looking for a great year. I always have two goals in mind. Goal number one, we want to win championships here. I've been a part of both of the ones we have. So I'd like to do that again. And I would like to get as many players signed in the process to go back to major league organizations. That's what we want to do. So it's really hard sometimes as you're losing players to replace the talent. But, you know, that's what we get paid to do. And uh, we try to do the best we can with that. I will tell you what I've seen in four days of spring training. We have a team that plays all out. They hustle. Um, it's been fun to watch. It's been a pleasure to see the chemistry in the clubhouse. And, and I think you'll see a, a very good product when we get out here next week. So with that said, uh, and by the way, the catcher's gear is really nice, maybe too nice to use. <laughs> <laughs> that might stay in my office for a while. Um, <laughs> So anyways, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce my coaching staff first, my medical staff, and then the ball players that are here. Um, I'll start with my third base coach and my bench coach who's been here just as long as me, uh, Inoel Polanco. Polo. <laughs> and back for his third year is my pitching coach who's done a really great job, Paul Fletcher. And our athletic trainer, Chong Choi. Chong, are you up? There he is. You wouldn't know it, but he never misses a meal. You wouldn't know it, though. That gives you a little sample of what goes on in the clubhouse, just, just so you know. Um, anyways, we'll start with the pitching staff. Uh, Wes also. Daniel Carrello. Mario Checo. Michael Click. Kelvin De La Cruz. Mike DeMarc. Ricardo Gomez. Tyrell Harris. Jorge Martinez. Mike McClendon. Matt Neal. Tony Pena. Ronnie Scudders. James Simmons. And a local guy from Dallas Town, Eric Thomas. And probably the guy that's embarrassed me the most in the clubhouse over the past three years, Bo Vaughn. I really wish I could tell the story, but I can't. And Micah Owings. And our catchers, our first model, Keith Castillo. And the other model, Sal Paniagua. Besides Tejada. And our infielders, Joel Guzman. 
Telvin Nash. This is a great team if you have a bench clearer. I, don't, I really don't have to worry about that. Andres Perez. Brian Pounds. And Josh Wilson. And our outfielders, Nick Ferdinand. Jason Ripko. Michael Rocket and James Simmons. You know, last year we had a couple bench clearing brawls with, well, not brawls, but bench clearing jaw dropping, you know, jaw arguments with Somerset. And uh, one of my former players is here, Stephen Penny, in the back. And uh, I was in the middle of both teams, and I thought, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. I'm holding my own here, these guys. And, and I turn around, and Penny's standing behind me with his arms folded. And I said, well, I guess that explains why nobody's messing with me. <laughs> so when you put your team together, you have to think about your uh, well-being when you're out there, because... I'm 55 years old and I'm not good for all that anymore like I used to be. But anyways, I just wanted to say uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, every year I've been here, I have a lot of familiar faces. This is a lot of fun for me and uh, starting tomorrow, we turn the lights on and play for real. So thank you for all your support and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you this summer. Thank you. So on, on behalf of uh, the three other speakers, and we, I think we have a few minutes if there are any questions, or did we tell you everything you ever wanted to know about the Atlantic League and the York Revolution? Any questions? Back here. Uh, Major Leagues have adopted wider netting. What's the story for yeah, the question was, uh, the Major Leagues have ado adopted wider netting. Uh, what's the story in our league? Last year, uh, the incident that precipitated that wider netting was about halfway through the major league, halfway through our season last year. And so we spent the last month of last season tracking literally every foul ball hit in this ballpark. We know where every one of them went. We also went back and looked at five years of incident reports of foul ball injuries in our ballpark, of which there are very few. What we found out is that there, it, it's, it's an all or nothing proposition in a minor league ballpark. In other words, that the distribution of injuries, those that did occur, and the distribution of foul balls is completely equal across this ballpark. In fact, the closest I've ever come to really get nailed in this park was standing in the skyboxes on the first base side. So what the major leagues have done in terms of extending the netting just to the dugout really has no effect in terms of, of significantly increasing safety in a minor league ballpark. However, minor league ballparks also have a feature that major league ballparks don't have, which is seats behind the net at the same price as any other seat. You can come sit behind our existing net for the same price as you can sit in any seat in our ballpark. So we're doing a couple things. The main thing that we are doing is promoting that fact and offering to reseat fans in a much more aggressive way with notices in the playbill and with PA announcements we're going to make it every game. And so at every game, we will be making it very clear to people that if they would prefer to sit behind a protective net, all they have to do is ask their usher, and the usher will move them there. And then secondarily, when we start to, to truly fill all those seats behind the net, then we'll extend that net another section to make sure that we can always accommodate any fan who wants to sit behind that net. So that's our response to it, which is rather than just a, a limited extension, which we know isn't really going to protect people, We'd rather protect 100% of the people who want to be protected and who are aware of that and then let the other fans who don't want to watch the game through a net enjoy the game that way. And we think that's a, a pretty good approach to it that's based on actual facts and the tracking of what happens at our ballpark. Any thoughts to premium seating above our nemesis? Absolutely. Uh, I have a meeting on Friday, in fact, with somebody to start the design of that. So. It's always something, as we've hit our 10th year here, that you look out and you picture Fenway Park and the monster seats. You look at the amount of steel that's holding up those 100 sheets of plywood. It's pretty significant. Um, and so we've always looked at that steel and thought, man, we, we could do something with that. So 
Yes, we are actually doing a preliminary design for those seats. I can't tell you whether from a code standpoint or a structural standpoint or a cost standpoint we can ever build them, but you can't look at that and not think about it. So we decided to find out. Other questions? Anything? All right, well, thank you very much. I should point out that...